today what I'm trying to do is uh, just set an uh, introduction to this whole thing as to why we are doing Kashmir Shaivism, okay? Um, and what is its relevance to our practice today? So, um, I haven't set any particular schedule for this. You know? So initially I thought in 10 weeks I'll finish this. Uh, now we are just going to go easy on that. I mean, let's see, maybe it will finish in 10, but uh, no set schedule as such. Okay? We'll, go, we'll meet every Tuesday and take it from there. Now, in, uh, we take Manasafa's principle, Ada. Okay? So Ada refers to grounding, grounding into the present. And in fact, today's concept, we can take it as pure grounding first, just ground. And, and we put this concept into our practice. Okay? So our yoga practice is basically grounded in asana practice. Okay? So whatever philosophy I've been teaching you or are continuing to teach you, I always try to encode the principles of the teachings into the sequences of the asanas. And it is through the means of the asanas that I really try to embody the teachings. So asana is really uh, a grounding place. It's a place to ground the teachings. It's a place to um, really connect. So asana truly is, the, uh, in one sense, the other. At any, any point of time also, if you are um, mentally caught up, uh, other principle is come back to the body. How is the body? How is the posture? So body and uh, the asana and awareness of it is truly uh, our other practice, grounding practice. Now, when you really now do a grounding practice into asana itself, so asana, the first layer grounding is asana, now you try to look into asana. Okay, what is the ground of asana? Okay, so when you look like that, the ground of asana, you'll find that you will end up in Hatha Yoga land. You know, that is the ground of asana. Okay. And when you look into that ground, that ground is, is uh, formed by um, teachings from various scriptures of Hatha Yoga. You know? So they are Hatha Yoga Pradibhika, Shiva Samhita, Yajnavalkya Samhita, Garanta Samhita. There are a few great teachers and few great texts which forms, they are all there on the ground of Hatha Yoga. So asana is really ground in Hatha Yoga. This much I think everybody is okay. Everybody knows asana practice, so it's a hatha yoga practice. Now, when you look into putting the other concept into hatha yoga, what is the ground of hatha yoga? Just now I said all the scriptures, okay, that is the ground. But when you look into the root, from where did these scriptures come out from? These scriptures of hatha yoga, etc., were formed around uh, 13th century. Okay, so that we are talking not so long back. Uh, the practices of yoga is supposed to be existing for such a long time and this we are talking only around 700 years, 800 years back. Okay, so what is before that? What is the Adha or the ground of this practice? Hatha, Hatha Yoga. And that's where problems start to develop. Okay, we don't know the ground. And uh, what happens in the, in the current context um, like, like what do we say when, when somebody is interested in yoga philosophy? For example, we say, well, I practice yoga and I'm really interested in the philosophy. What is the philosophy of yoga most people know? They will talk about Patanjali's Yama Niyama and also they will say, I know about the five koshas, I know about the three sharidas. These two are uh, two philosophies which, has really, which is really dominating the scene of philosophy nowadays, okay, in terms of yoga practice. But if you deeply look into Hatha Yoga Pradibhika, that ground text for us, that author who is called Swatmarama makes it very clear, I think in the third verse itself, he puts a list of his teachers. And that's a big list of a lot of teachers, okay. So this is, he's writing in the 13th century and he puts a long list of teachers. And it can't be that all these teachers actually taught him physically. He's putting down a lineage of teachers, which will extend back a long way. And so he talks about Matsyendranath, he talks about Gurathnath, he talks about Kapali, he talks about Ananda Bhairava. There are so many of these teachers. And he makes it clear what is the source of Hatha Yoga. Okay? Now, what you have to note here is two points. First is 
Swatmarama is not shy of saying who his teachers are. Okay, so he's bigger than that. He's really giving credit to a huge list of teachers. Okay, and second thing you have to notice is in this exhaustive list, Padanjali's name is not there. Okay, second is another giant who is Shankaracharya Vedanta, his name is also not there. These two giants who dominates today's philosophy of yoga is absolutely not mentioned by the author of Hatha Yoga in his salutation verse where he acknowledges all possible teachers. So then to know that this is where Hatha Yoga's ground is totally artificial. We don't have a ground, the present generation practice. Okay? Uh, everybody uh, is into sutras and they will all go to some Vedanta and uh, what they are really good at is putting down Hatha Yoga practice because Vedanta tradition has been there for such a long time. They are never used to uh, contemplating in an asana. That is not their practice at all. So they don't know what it is and it is their, um, they take great pride and happiness in putting down asana practice. And the asana practitioners go and take it because we don't know what is our philosophy. Okay? We go there and uh, we have nothing to say and, and then we will come back and then um, those who are, the others who are following Padanjali philosophy, what does Padanjali say? You want to, for liberation, you have to get out of the body. Liberation or enlightenment is like a bird getting out of a cage. They say you have to be free from body. So that's why like many famous teachers of the Iyengar tradition, uh, they say that uh, asana is not, not at all the important thing. Just now down there, there was a yoga journal. I just took the back page, a very famous teacher, some, uh, I forgot the name. So he's saying, you know, asana should be, uh, asana is not the main thing. Uh, you have to meditate to feel the soul within. That is clearly Padanjali yoga philosophy. Okay, where you're constantly putting body down, uh, asana down, and, and whoever puts asana down, immediately gets a halo that he, he or she is spiritual. Okay, so this is a very sad ground uh, which we have right now. Okay, the ground of Hatha Yoga, which is not Padanjali's Yoga Sutra, which is not Shankara's Vedanta, but right now we are clinging on there. Okay, so that's what I want to address today. So, partly this gross um, oversight um, is due to one confusing verse which Swatmarama himself put in the opening verse of Hatha Yoga Pradibhika. He writes that his scripture, his teaching of Hatha Yoga is for people to scale the heights of Raja Yoga. Okay? That one statement has been uh, interpreted as to say that is an abject confession by the author of Hatha Yoga itself. He's saying that this is a preparatory practice to somehow rise up to the, and then start Raja Yoga. You know? So this is like a preparatory practice, it's like a ladder to step into the hallowed uh, hall of Raja Yoga, which is that Padanjali tradition. So that is, the, um, that is a common understanding. And, uh, um, it, and, and, but to understand what is Raja Yoga as meant by Swatmarama, we only have to study this particular scripture, Hatha Yoga Pradipika. He will clearly explain in the fourth chapter, he will clearly explain what he means by Raja Yoga. He says that Raja Yoga is just another word he is using for Samadhi, for Manonmani, for Laya. It's just like a, like a generic term he is using for all these absorptions. Okay, it's not as a part of practice. Raja Yoga in one sense refers to Ashtanga Yoga of Padanjali as a part of practice. But Swatmarama makes it very clear, he says that he's not referring to a path, he's referring to a state. And this state can, is called by other names such as Samadhi, such as Laya, such as Mano. He makes it very clear. He's not referring Raja Yoga as another system. He just means it to be that deep absorption. Okay? And uh, this absorption, then he goes on to say that this occurs, the state of Raja Yoga occurs when you can pierce the blocks in your Sushumna. He makes it very clear what he means by Raja Yoga. He says that a practitioner goes through four stages. First stage is called the Aramba Avastha, meaning the, um, 
the entry point, the beginner stage, but the beginner stage he is referring to a quite an advanced stage. He's saying the beginning of entry into this sushimna, into this subtle energy channel. And he says the beginning stage is when you pierce Muladhara, blocks occurring in Muladhara chakra, you get a release from it. Okay, you release that 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 solid binding material material materiality and you get a release from it. That's a piercing of the Muladhara. And that is the beginning stage. And then he says is uh, Gata Avasta. That is the state of the vessel, the empty port. And that when you break the block in your heart. He says that Vishnu Granthi. Granthi means a block. Okay, the root one is called Brahma Granthi. This is called Vishnu Where Sushimna, the energy rises up and it breaks open all blockages in your heart. Okay, you break that open. And then you experience the state of the Vishuddhi, which is the third stage, which is called Parichaya Avastha, which is like seasoned practitioner where you, where you are at a, a level of bliss, no matter what is happening. Okay, that, that's a seasoned practitioner. And then finally he says the Raja Yoga level is when you pierce the Rudra Grandhi, that is the third eye block. Okay, so in the path of Sushimna there are these blocks, three main blocks, the breaking of that is the practice of Hatha Yoga. And when this Rudra Grandhi, which is the third eye block, when that gets broken, that is the stage of Raja Yoga or Samadhi uh, according to Swatmarama. Now, this is four stages. This has nothing to do with the other two philosophies. Subtle body philosophy, it is here that we start to understand. The subtle body philosophy totally belongs to another tradition and that is the Tantras. Okay? It doesn't belong in any detail in Padanjali Sutras, neither in Vedanta. Okay? So, this belongs to Tantric tradition. Okay, so this is where you know where our ground is. Okay, so tantra. Now, tantra. Um, one issue was tantra is a household tradition. Okay, so is a household tradition, not a monastic tradition. Now, monastic traditions uh, they also need a family. Though they say they are monastics, what they do is they will also group together, form an ashram, form an institution. And that gets very strong. Then everything is that institution. And in that way, their teachings get very strong. There is an established organization. They will send their monks everywhere. And the teachings spread everywhere. Okay? So Vedanta, uh, mainly, uh, Shankaracharya established really some uh, monasteries, some ashrams. And the teachings started to spread everywhere. But these are monastic traditions. Now, Tantra is a householder tradition. They are not interested in institutionalizing. They don't believe in setting up an institution and spreading teachers everywhere. They are just happy to practice this householder tradition. Okay. So it is not so well known by people because there hasn't been, there is not a place where we can say that go to a tantric ashram and stay there. We can't say that. Okay. I think that Osho Rajneesh had something, but uh, um, generally we don't have so much of uh, established uh, teaching schools. Okay. So, uh, so people don't know much about it. And then they had a lot of bizarre practices, uh, Tantra. Tantra is very big. If you ask me what is Tantra, I can't answer you straight away. I will only tell you what I am picking up from Tantra, which we are following. That is Tantra for me. But Tantra is very big and they have um, very, very funny practices too. So um, at some point of time, maybe the yoga practitioners do not want to say that our background, our foundation is uh, Tantra. Because the moment you say that, people uh, think you are a bit funny person. You, know, you are immoral, you can do anything anytime. And uh, so uh, people started to get more into the decent, so as to say. Uh, Patanjali and uh, the Vedantic teachings are really like noble uh, in, in, in a way. So, I mean, these are things, this is me talking now. Why Tantra suddenly the ground of Hatha Yoga was just, just dissolved. I mean, we just decided to put another layer over that ground and that is the artificial layering of Padanjali and uh, Shankara's Vedanta as uh, Hatha Yoga's philosophy. Let me tell you, there is nothing wrong in these great philosophies. I also teach you that all the time. But 
that is additional philosophy to to help us we bring them all together you know we we are we would like to be embraced by all these philosophies but you have to clearly know when we say hatha yoga really we are tired of people saying hatha yoga is a physical hatha yoga is a preparatory practice for getting real liberation you have to do patanjali path or you have to get into vedanta path uh, what do you do stand on your head really tiring so at least uh from now on at least our group of teachers should be very clear um hatha yoga is not meant for some physical thing it's got four chapters hatha yoga pradipika first chapter is on asanas that's only 67 verses the last chapter is samadhi which has got 114 verses almost double that of padanjali samadhi pada so the hatha yoga tradition is also totally looking at samadhi they are saying this whole book this whole scripture is for scaling the heights of raja yoga what they are saying is he is providing you a systematic way by which you can scale into the height and the the ladder through which the sushumna can be scaled you go through the muladhara you go to break the vishnu grandi you break the rudra grandi you are liberated okay so that, that is um, very 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 clear as as to what he means by raja yoga i think is verse somewhere in the 70 range he he clearly says uh, eki bhutam meaning only one element tat chittam the chitta gets really connected to eki bhutam previous verse he is saying is when you break the third eye block and then you are really settled into that kind of consciousness eki bhutam and uh, that is called raja yoga abhidanagam he clearly says that state is raja yoga okay so um so this is what i wanted to tell you in the first place knowing that the ground which is held as our philosophical ground is not really the philosophical ground of hatha yoga though it's great to study from it and our real ground is tantra okay tantra is huge it's big and and um, and uh, and the word tantra is originally is referring to only certain revealed scriptures i mean this is what the traditions say certain revealed scriptures alone are called tantras and these traditions talk about different tantras in the form of uh, shaiva tantras where the the revelation source would be always credited to either shiva or shakti okay uh, and then there are some other tantras where the revelation seems to be they will say it coming from vishnu then the vaishnava tantras are formed but we are mainly linked with um, that shaiva tantras okay and the shaiva tantras is what we are really looking at and for me shaiva tantras is the philosophical ground of hatha yoga what is the ground of hatha yoga it is the shaiva tantras and when you look at shaiva tantra when you study shaiva tantra you'll find that the same philosophy of hatha yoga is echoed there because for them what they're telling is um i mean they they say that our karma our actions create samskaras and they become like a solidified uh, really a solidified thing which forms a layer in your subtle channels and this has to be broken and this has to be this collects in sushumna and this has to be broken and they clearly say that it can be broken by practices which center your awareness into the spine and you can break the granthis exactly same verse is what hatha yoga pradipika uses is it clear sharma so um, clearly if you study the shaivism we will find that there is such similarity you know it is taken straight from there and shaivism is the body of language where body of teaching where the subtle body is celebrated okay this whole chakra nadi kundalini comes first in the shaiva tantras okay and the the entire practice of hatha yoga is towards connecting with this subtle body through the gross body we are not discarding the gross body we are using the gross body the grossness is only the grossness of our perception the body is energy but when we look we give it certain gross ideas and as our vision gets deeper our own conditioned layer of ignorance we break through and we really connect to what body is and then we experience body as a subtle energy pattern is not like gross body has to be removed to see subtle body is not like that gross body is our ignorant viewing of the body what we view now that is a gross body which is a 
formation due to ignorance in my own perception. When my perception gets clear, when the Mula Granthi gr gr gets broken, I clearly see through matter, I can understand. Then I have another experience and that is a subtle body. So this whole thing comes from Shaivism. Okay? So we have to really uphold that. Um, just now, like uh, I was telling somebody, today's talk, please sit back, it will be useful because I'm talking about Hatha Yoga. And they said, I thought you were going to talk about Kashmir Shaivism. If only you told me you were talking about Hatha Yoga, I would have stayed back. Because the word Kashmir Shaivism maybe sounds like a bit, you know, like religious Shaivism. And Hatha Yoga, so such ignorance is there. But at least listening should be there. Then you will understand that it is, uh, no, Hatha Yoga and Shaivism are not two separate things. Separation has been brought about uh, by our current generation who doesn't study Hatha Yoga Pradivika, who only comments about it in a putting down way. Okay, so any questions right now? Otherwise you will slip into sleepy land. Yeah, so. Yes, good question. So this is coming, Hatha Yoga Pradipika is coming in the 13th century. Uh, Padanjali lived really around close to 2000, 2500 years back. So he is way senior to this. So definitely Swatmarama knew about Padanjali. He must have learned from it, he must have got insights from it, all that is there. It's just that he's not saying his vision, his philosophy is not like Padanjali's philosophy. That's what he makes it very, very clear. Uh, because uh, he, he again says as Raja Yoga is Samadhi, but Padanjali also says Yoga is Samadhi. So he really makes it very clear, he says that in my teaching, Swatmarama says, Samadhi means the ending of dualities, okay? Where the limited merges with the limitless, like a small piece of salt when we put into the ocean, it becomes one with the ocean. The limited thing becomes, merges with the limitless. So he's saying, the ending of duality is my samadhi. Whereas Patanjali says, separation from the limited and staying alone, kaivilya, as the limitless, that is the samadhi. So he really goes at length to explain that this is not that samadhi. This is not Patanjali's path. And the last verse of samadhi, his samadhi chapter, 114th verse, he says that, I really know people are going to talk funny about this. Yeah, they won't study this, they are going to judge this. So with that he ends it, you know, like he knows this is going to happen. You know? Because he knows perhaps he has used the word Raja Yoga, it is there. You know? So normally people, what do they do? The first page of the book, and it says Raja Yoga, it is for Raja Yoga, okay? Vedanta also, Vedanta actually, uh, Shankara comes just a little bit later after Padanjali. Okay, there are uh, groups of uh, certain lines, uh, certain uh, groups of uh, scholars who think that Shankaracharya might have been initially in, in the teaching traditions of Padanjali. Because Padanjali emphasized Dvaida, two. You have to separate. Okay, Shankara suddenly comes out and his whole philosophy, Advaita, he says non-dual. So for him to emphasize that, first, first he had to be, somebody had to be telling him that there is Dvaita. There are two things and you don't get, get caught in the wrong thing, get connected to the real thing, Purusha. So we don't have to believe it, but there are people who believe that uh, Shankaracharya was first exposed to Padanjali's teachings, which he didn't, um, he didn't connect to, he wanted to connect to Advaita. Sankhya before that. Sankhya even before Patanjali. Okay, so that's duality. And Patanjali's philosophy is on that Sankhya. Okay, then Shankaracharya comes, he's, he's a super strong uh, speaker and teacher and sage. And then he established, Patanjali also never established like uh, institutions. Uh, Shankaracharya went the length and breadth of India, he traveled across, got people into debate, he established a monastic tradition who will spread the teachings. Then it, it started to wipe out, all other philosophies got wiped out. And uh, Padanjali survives only because of the Hatha Yoga people. Okay? There is no uh, school in India which simply holds up Padanjali. Padanjali was, started to get a second lease uh, after Krishna Majarya. He started to push Padanjali as the teacher of uh, all yoga practices, including Hatha Yoga. And then, um, see, Shankaracharya did, 
did make a salutary verse on Padanjali. So definitely Shankaracharya comes after Padanjali. The, the particular verse we are chanting, that is attributed to Shankaracharya, who made that Abahu Purushakaram Shankaracharya, that is supposed to be written by Shankaracharya, uh, saluting Padanjali as a teacher. So he says that, I salute you as a great teacher, though I don't agree with your duality concept, but you're a great teacher, you know, my, my salutations to you. So, um, yeah, it's good to know that kind of uh, flow of the unfolding of yoga. So we will always say that initially it was a bhakti traditions, people who are just into the devotional mode, then the thinkers started to look into, then the sankhya came into being, then uh, the philosophy started to get a direction, you know, because that is a strong opinion which says that there are two things, then Shankaracharya comes with another strong assertion that no, Advaita, and, uh, and, and then parallel to this, these are just householder traditions, um, the tantric, especially the Chaiva Tantra. They're not going anywhere, they're not going into debates, they're just sitting and teaching. But it's just wonderful teaching, okay? So, this is uh, like an overview of uh, Tantra, uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, um, and, uh, and Kashmiri, Kashmir, that place just became like a vortex. We don't know why, but these huge, huge thinkers and teachers uh, sat there and taught. So that's why it's called Kashmiri Shaivism. Because the Shaivism itself is divided originally into two. Um, and uh, one is the Shiva traditions, where the still consciousness is given extreme importance. Okay, so the, the, the two uh, tantras, revealed tantras, which is supposed to be there, um, they are called the Shaiva Siddhanta and the Bhairava Tantras. You know, these, these were two which is really connecting to that stillness consciousness. And that sounds very much like Vedanta, which talks about Brahman. Everything is one consciousness and you have to connect to it. There is no talk on Spanda and dynamism and all that. But then the next group, uh, the teaching started to look really into the dynamism of consciousness, into the energy nature of universe. And they are called the Vidyas, you know, the, the Vidya tradition. They are more feminine oriented. And Hatha Yoga comes right from that tradition, which upholds Shakti, which upholds the dynamic movements of consciousness as the reality of the universe. Okay, so. Anything Shanti? Seema? Shaiva Siddhanta and Bhairava Tantras both uphold Shiva as, as, a stillness, as, a, as a stillness consciousness and they were moving towards that. The dynamic nature of Shiva, the Shakti, was not the main uh, teaching. That is called, that is coming under Vidya traditions. Vidya, okay. Okay, so are we kind of clear till now? Sort of, sort of is good. Um, yeah. So when people say Hatha Yoga is physical, not spiritual, what would you say? I mean, we don't want to get into an argument or something. This can be a sincere person who is just somehow sadly ignorant. And uh, the conversation should be, you should ask them, why do you say so? Okay, then they will say Hatha Yoga is asana or what? Like that they will say. Um, then you have to tell them Hatha Yoga Pradipi has four chapters. The first chapter is asana. All together it has only 67 verses. Out of that only around 16 verses talk about asana. And then the rest the chapters, Kundalini, four chapters, Samadhi. And fourth chapter is 114 verses talking only about Samadhi. Okay, that merging into that, that pure spiritual consciousness. So... Uh, so then maybe they might, they might then say, no, first verse of Hatha Yoga Pradipika itself, they say that this is for scaling the height of Raja Yoga. Is in Raja Yoga Padanjali's path? That's when you have to tell that in Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the author himself makes it clear what he means by Raja Yoga. That is the breaking of the blocks in Sushumna. Okay? And this breaking of the blocks of Sushumna, such ideas come directly from Tantra and a branch of Tantra called Kashmir Shaivism. And this is purely a non-dual spiritual philosophy. Okay? Even anything coming under this is spiritual because their whole idea is to break blockages within and to experience that free, uh, that freedom, okay? that, that oneness consciousness. You know? so, 
um, that is how we should notice. Now, now, now the beginning of what else to tell you? Okay, now when we look at Kashmir Shaivism, Kashmir Shaivism also got, um, I mean, his, his original uh, tantras, um, I don't know much about that, okay, I, I, because many of it is not translated and uh, I've only got direct references to those tantras. What we are really studying is, after the after that, I think the original tantras, meaning these are revelatory, so they're just given a respect like that. You know, if, you, if you're calling something a tantra, that is a revelatory uh, teaching. Um, but these teachers who apparently got his revelation or insights, then they start to practice, and it's around 500 years later that their written works started to come out. These teachers writing from their experience, that's beautiful philosophical written works. These are not revealed works. These are written, well thought out uh, teachings. And that is our support of Kashmir Shaivism. Uh, we don't even know what those revealed scriptures are. I mean, that's, that's supposed to have happened and these teachers got great inspiration and then they practiced for around 300, 400 years because that much gap is there uh, before we see these books really coming out. Okay, so that is our support. So one of the first book to come out was Shiva Sutras, written by a sage called Vasugupta. Okay. Yeah, so he is uh, given great importance in this teaching tradition. And uh, however, this particular text we are going to explore from next week onwards, this is not written by Vasugupta. Okay, this is called Spandakarigas. Okay, Spandakarigas. The first text which uh, people got about Kashmir Shaivism was Shiva Sutras. It's after that that the Spandakarigas came and generally it is upheld that it is Vasugupta himself who wrote Spandakarigas. This is all happening, it's a bit hazy, the authorship. Uh, whereas uh, some lines of thinking which I kind of relate to, uh, they somehow don't believe that uh, Vasugupta wrote Spandakarigas and this is ascribed to another sage called Kalata K-A-L-L-A-T-A -A. I, will, I will mail you all this if we form that Facebook group I can just send the relevant names and all that into that so, so it's a Kalata who wrote uh, the Spandakarigas and um, this whole Kashmir Shaivism then is again divided into different groups uh, you have the Shiva Sutra group Okay. And then you have something called the Krama tradition. Okay. Krama, K-R-A-M-A, -A, Krama tradition. Krama means sequence, progression. And Spandakariga sits right at the heart of this Krama tradition. And this word is even used in, in Vinyasa Krama. You know, Vinyasa Krama. The, the sequence, the special sequencing of things. So, Krama for me is our mother tradition. The whole Hatha Yoga and Vinyasa, everything is, is coming out from that Krama tradition. Okay? Now, the origin of Krama tradition is quite fantastic. It's a story and, uh, and through this we get an introduction to our one of the grand teachers. His name is Jnana Netra, okay? I will send you by that Facebook group if you form that. Jnana Netra, meaning the one with the eye of the wisdom. Jnana means knowledge or wisdom, Netra means eyes. So he is so called because one day after his uh, contemplation and meditation, he was walking and he finds himself straying into a symmetry, into a, a, a what do you call it? A burning grounds. Okay, so where the dead bodies are burned, yeah, um, yeah, cremation grounds, okay, yeah, cremation grounds, okay, where you really are putting on fire these bodies. And um, normally in the, uh, this, this place is not supposed to be a good place to go. Okay, so spiritual people, they like to be in more uh, conducive environment for contemplation and meditation 
and normally only the um, kind of the uh, people of the lower rung goes into these places and puts the bodies into fire cleaning is done or sometimes some of these unruly elements like the the thieves and all of them might, the homeless etc. might find a place in this uh, cremation grounds. But anyway, this exalted sage uh, finds himself uh, just beside a huge cremation ground and somehow he gets intoxicated with that whole place, He's, he decides to walk into it. He just explores this cremation ground and this is a place again in Kashmir in Uddiyana, O-D-D-I-Y-A-N-A. That valley is where this cremation ground was and he walks into this place. And after a lot of exploring, suddenly at a distance he sees a really a wild party going on. Okay? There's a blazing fire in the middle and around that he sees 12 dancers dancing ecstatically, 12 ladies. So this is the beginning of this female teaching tradition starting. This is all revolutionary, radical, because till then it's quite patriarchal. You know? So here, this great sage coming and seeing 12 ladies dancing ecstatically around the fire, and uh, he, is, uh, he feels both fear and awe. It's beautiful, but it's fearful, because there seem to be such raw energy. And he starts to go a little bit closer, slowly, slowly, and then his fear grows higher because he sees that these ladies have skulls. They're wearing garlands of skulls. They have blood pouring over. And in their hands, they have these this body parts of the cremation ground. They're, they're taking it and throwing it. And it's that kind of dance. Okay? And Jnana Netra is really watching this. So though this is horrifying, he keeps watching. Because there's some raw beauty here. Something keeps him there. He's absolutely petrified, but he doesn't walk away. So that's all why later he's called Jnana Netra. He's at Netra, he kept on knowing this. He kept on seeing this. Then what happens is suddenly it's like as if he's waking up himself. He's watching, but then an awakening occurs. And now he finds himself and the center of that fire around which these ladies were dancing. And he finds them as like, he says it's like demi-goddesses. They're not human as such. They're raw energies and they're dancing around the fire which he himself is. Okay, these are tall ladies swaying around in circular motion and then his insights deepen and then he says this entire flame which he thought was himself, he experiences it as, he just says it's Kali, the, the energy of time. You know, he, he experiences himself as that pure, beyond identity, pure process, pure time, pure energy, shakti. He experiences it. And this circular, dynamically weaving um, dances, he sees as his own emotions and senses and bodily energies and five pranas, everything just swirling around, wildly swaying and dancing. Okay? So if you, if you fall prey for them, you know, the things they show is like you're finished. Like how many of us are really killing ourselves with wrong thoughts? We are really giving ourselves into wrong, uh, wrong actions, which is dismembering ourselves, you know. So it's that kind of dance he sees. It's, it's, it's his own mental energies, physical energies, and he gets that great realization, okay? And that is a historical moment for us. That's the birth of the Krama tradition. He sees this circular sequential flow of the 12 goddesses which I will explain to you next week, okay? What these 12 goddesses are, you know, really as energetic forces in our own being. And um, so then he started writing about it and, and he says you can get the same experience. Now when we look deeper, what is the cremation ground? Cremation ground, it was fanciful to say in those days that the body is a dead. The body is real jada, meaning dead thing. The only thing you should focus on is consciousness. You know, that is the way the, the other philosophies was looking at. So they will discard body, they will not look into body, as so that is something not for spiritual. So when he says he stepped into the cremation grounds, what he is meaning is he's stepping into the land of the body. Okay? Where death is always happening. Okay? And also birth is happening. Srishti, Samhara, Stidhi, these kind of forces, which I will explain next time. This, these Kalis are 12 Kalis, which is called Srishti Kali, Samhara Kali, Stidhi Kali, Rakta Kali. Like, th these are all like energies within the body, he experiences it. 
and the body is not experienced as this thing and you look inside you see some dance it is something else he experiences it in an energetic level so and 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 he also so this tradition what you have to watch here is they don't see body as an obstacle in spiritual progress and insights they see it as an aid so this is revolutionary so you have to see like where is our home base philosophy okay uh we say that if we want to separate from body for our spiritual insight but you're all the time doing asana and you're really concentrating on asana we have to be defensive when such a question comes from people in vedanta and sutra philosophy ask you okay because their idea is to get away from the body and then we have to know this is the philosophy okay jnana netra teaching the krama tradition step into the body feel this dance of energy you know this circular uh, dance of energies and he these energies are also standing for the mind which is experiencing the body so the things which are normally uh, seen as uh, like dirty or defile in other systems here jnana netra system as a very aids in spiritual progress so the mind and the body is not seen as something evil you know because there are, are stereotype new age spiritualists who will say oh discard the body discard the ego drop the i and o oh, and all that and you will get a million likes for these things like today if i put this okay absolutely no like no share but if people put like drop the ego and realize the oneness profound like 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 beautiful and uh, so, so so that is the way things are just moving and uh, we see that also as a dance you know but if you really look deeper this idea of dropping the mind dropping the ego you know is through them that this philosophy says is through them you look into that through the eyes the jnana netra then that realization occurs that's a krama tradition we are not putting down any philosophy in different ways the insights can happen okay you can go that way but you can definitely go this way too so this is the birth of all this hatha yoga body based mind based chakra based practices the chakras is like that twelve dancing around and we are they are not saying samsara is a problem samsara is going around in circles he is saying watch this dance like we are going around in circles this energy and you just watch it you know like so like we don't have to worry when we are thinking of the same person thinking of that even thinking of and keep on suffering they are saying that's the way the mind moves you look at this you see it as a dance and you you really kind of sit there and say he he aesthetically sings he says like shri krodha like anger okay he says like the anger which is felt he sees it as a teacher uh, can you teach me what you are you know and then he will say shri shri is another name for auspiciousness and you know like like sadness or shri lust and these things will later this krama tradition will after this krama tradition you have the spanda karigas coming which i will teach you but this goes on in the evolution of yoga later the sri vidya tradition start directly from krama okay where you have the great text called yogini hrudaya which is coming in the 10th century totally inspired by inspired by the krama tradition then you have the sri chakra which i have taught you once the sri chakra comes directly from that krama and then um, and after that um, there is this uh, uh um, 13th century machendranath comes up with a philosophy and that is directly from the sri vidya and then hatha yoga forms after that okay so is is all connected okay so so it's important for us to know so this is the vision from which this whole thing of body based practice mind based practice starts so we have to really not see us as somehow inferior in in our spiritual practice you know when people do asanas and somebody else do sitting practice we don't have to see that as superior to this okay this is also a way you're stepping into this land to feel this dance of energy which is happening okay so this is jnana netra and um, um and it's a bit after this that um the great sage called abhinava gupta gets born okay and he's he is the most renowned um because he wrote extensively and the fantastic uh, works he has and um, he gave he made he wrote his own uh, lot of great uh, scriptures but again this particular 
series I'm teaching you is not an Abhinava Gupta work. Okay? This is teaching on Spandakariga and I am going to teach you purely on the basis of one commentator because we are not sure of the author. Some people say Vasugupta, some people say Kalata, but the greatest commentator is a commentator known as Shema Raja. Shema Raja. Yeah, so these are all our pioneer teachers, but somehow we are not at all in the know of them. Okay, so Shema Raja, and this Shema Raja wrote two fantastic commentaries on this scripture. One commentary he gave just on the opening verse of Spandakarigas. Just the opening verse, he wrote an entire commentary on that. Okay? It's called Spanda Sandoha. And then later he wrote a commentary which explains each verse. So it is on that basis which I am going to teach you this particular uh, text. Okay? So from next week, we'll be stepping straight into the actual Sanskrit verse and then through the heart of Kshemaraja, we will immerse uh, into this feeling of energy. So um, that's what I just want to teach you.